Thank you all uh, for reconvening. This session will provide an overview of uh, coaching ed education certification requirements and professional development at various levels of, of sports. Uh, the Knight Commission has highlighted the importance of this issue at past meetings and at our meeting earlier this year. We re-emphasized our call in 2015 for the NCAA under the leadership of university presidents to develop minimal standards that NCAA coaches would be required to meet to ensure they are prepared for their roles in protecting the health and safety of student athletes and for their roles as educators and leaders in the development of student athletes. We look forward to hearing from this panel of leaders about their work on these related issues. Again, as a reminder, please use the microphones when speaking, and also a reminder that the bios and accomplishments for the panelists are provided in the meeting materials. So at this time, I will just provide a brief introduction of the panelists in the order in which they will provide their remarks. First, Terry Steve Gronow, Vice President of Division II, the NCAA. Tom Cantrell, head baseball coach, University of North Georgia. Davis Whitfield, chief operating officer, National Federation of State High School Associations. Dan Schuster, director of educational services, National Federation of State High School Associations. And Danielle Donahue, Executive Director of Women Basketball Coaches Association. Thank you to all of our panelists. We'll begin with Terry. Well, and, and thank you, Dr. Cartwright, and thank you, Dr. Duncan, and, and thanks to all of the commission for the opportunity to be here um, today when Coach Cantrell and I were invited to come and speak to you about Division II University. Uh, we were thrilled. Uh, we know as a commission you've called for efforts to ensure that coaches are prepared for their roles as educators and leaders in the development of student athletes. And we believe that Division II University serves that purpose as an online interactive educational delivery system that um, not only will help coaches know the rules, but also their roles within college athletics. Um, there is no other athletic administrator that interacts with student athletes the way that coaches do. And we certainly had that relationship in mind when we created Division II University. But before I dive into Division II University, I do want to talk a little bit about just Division II itself. Um, for the better part of Division II's 45-year history, um, the division has been quite intentional about encouraging members to offer student athletes a balanced college experience, to really look at not only what they could pursue academically, what they can do on the court or in the classroom, and to engage in meaningful opportunities with both the local campus community and the local regional area. In other words, we really want student athletes to reap all the benefits of their college experience to prepare them for life after graduation. Of course, all NCA institutions, regardless of division, aspire to that basic purpose, but the balance theme really does resonate within Division II. Student athletes can achieve their athletic goals while still having access to opportunities that are available to all students to enrich their college years. Division II coaches certainly need to understand that core message as their interaction with prospective and current student athletes is, makes them one of our most high profile ambassadors. Many times the coaching profession can per be perceived as only winning or losing. But anyone that knows who's worn the whistle that developing people for success beyond athletics is what's most important. While everyone wants to win in competition, winning in life is the most important and something I know this commission believe strongly. That's why Division II University is such an important effort. While the broader strategy with this new online platform is to change the way Division II delivers educational material to its schools, the initial focus was on coaches, and that was for two specific reasons. One, any time you create an initiative of this magnitude, it's important to narrow your focus to ensure you are creating buy-in from all of your stakeholders and to continue to build on that momentum. And two, our coaches told us that they wanted to be more engaged, and we listened. In 2013, based on results from a membership census, it showed that coaches as a group were least likely to feel informed or engaged or really know the nuts and bolts about the division and our philosophical expectations. Given what I said earlier about coaches being our best boots on the ground ambassadors, 
We believe as a division that we needed to do a better job communicating with coaches. We looked at how we currently train our coaches to be good stewards of the division, and the primary tool is a years-old coaches certification test that is, that is essentially an exercise in memorization, which really isn't good for overall learning. Most coaches actually dread taking the test each year, not because it's hard, but because it's tedious and archaic. So we collaborated with our membership to develop a new way to enhance coaches' engagement and understanding of the rules as they pertain to Division II athletics. So Division II University was launched this past May, and we already have 28 interactive modules that address not only recruiting and eligibility, but also health and safety training, including ways to enhance student-athlete mental health and wellness, and education on the prevention of sexual violence. The health and safety component is key. Coaches have always been held accountable for knowing the rules regarding recruiting and eligibility, but adding the health and wellness modules demonstrates our commitment to training coaches to develop not only the student, but the athlete and the whole person. The modules have been successful thus far. There is a proposal um, before the Division II membership at the 2019 convention that will replace the coaches <coughs> certification test with the requirement to complete modules in Division II University. Um, the penalties for failure to complete will continue to be the um, ineligibility to be able to recruit off campus, but there's an additional penalty that will also apply that um, in order to participate in countable athletically related activities, coaches will have to pass the modules in Division II University. The feedback that we're receiving from coaches has been very positive. Mm -hmm. We're also receiving um, great um, positive um, interaction from athletic administrators. One of the most positive pieces that we're receiving is that coaches can really complete these modules anywhere, whether that's on the road, um, out recruiting, because they can do it on any type of phone, tablet, or even their laptop. As far as athletic administrators, they're also using it to help with training of their financial aid officers as well as their registrars. We always like to refer to Division II University as really building a skyscraper. We're currently at the ground level, and we believe the sky's the limit. We think we can expand this educational platform to include all types of groups, including presidents, athletic directors, clients, compliance administrators, <coughs> faculty athletic representatives, and student athletes. So now Amanda Conklin, who's an associate director at the NCAA, who was um, instrumental in leading this effort to create Division II University and I, are gonna uh, show you a couple demonstrations of Division II University, and then Coach Cantrell is gonna speak to you from a coaching perspective as a um, thorough user of uh, Division II University thus far. So what you'll see up on the screen here is the Division II uh, landing page. This is what coaches will see when they come in. They can load in onto all of their courses, and you'll note again that there are 28 courses that are already available, and we just want to show you a demo of one of those. There'll be some introductory information that the coach will see when he comes in, he or she comes in, and then it'll launch into the course itself. There is sound to make it more engaging. <laughs> I think while we're trying to figure out the audio, I'm going to let Coach Cantrell um, speak a little bit to um, his experience with the modules. You want me to go into that too? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, when we were notified uh, in one of our coaches' meetings at North Georgia about the, uh, this possibility of the test going away and these educational modules becoming uh, for us to take, it was, 
it was very well received. <laughs> if, you, uh, if, if you're not taking the coach's test before, it is a very tedious thing that you get prepared for once a year. You don't think about it except the week before you're getting ready to take it. And all you want to do is to make sure that uh, you got 80 minutes to, to answer those 40 questions and you get 80% right. So really after the fact, I mean, you know rules and regulations and things of that nature, but you don't, you don't concern yourself about the test again. So when the, when the D2 University came available and uh, we were told about it uh, in one of our coaches' meetings at the University of North Georgia, let's say keep us very informed, uh, you know, we, me and my coaching staff being proactive as we are, we said, well, let's go check it out and let's see what the difference is going to be uh, between taking the test and doing the educational modules. And what we found out, the educational modules are much better. It's much better information that uh, you can access. You can do a module uh, at your own pace. If you, if you need to take a break from it, you can do two or three at a time. Uh, me and my staff did all 20 at the time that were on there in the course of two days uh, because they were just, they were easy to take and there was more informational to it. The, the big thing about it too, if you have a situation I think that comes up, uh, there, it, it, you can always go back to the book, but I think the module, the D2 University, the way that it's set up, it can be, it can help you ascertain the answer that you want a lot quicker than going through the, uh, to, to the coach's manual. Shall, shall we? I think that might, yeah, if we could just move maybe to the next set of panelists and hopefully we'll get the okay. audio visual Great. corrected. Okay. Yeah. And, I, and I think we probably have a feel for, it, it would be good to see it, but I think we have a feel for what it is. Uh, so, Davis, over to you. Thank you, Chair Cartwright and Chair Duncan for having us today from the National Federation of State High School Associations. We are based in Indianapolis, Indiana, right next to our colleagues at the NCAA. And uh, it's wonderful to be here with you today uh, with the Knight Commission. Uh, just a sense of who we are, the National Federation of State High School Associations is a national leadership organization for high school athletics and activities across the country. Uh, our members, if we can get the PowerPoint up, uh, consist of the 50 states and D.C. We give the District of Columbia statehood at the NFHS. <laughs> So we have 51 members, and each of those 50 state association, 51 state associations govern independently within their respective state and here within the district. Uh, our learning center uh, actually works with our state associations to uh, serve 19,500 high schools across the country, as well as almost 12 million participants that participate in our athletics and activity programs. We'll catch up in just a moment. Uh, our Learning Center uh, began in 2007, and Dan Schuster is the director of our Learning Center and does a wonderful job with uh, the online education programs. So you see there are 51 member state associations, the uh, 19,500 uh, high schools that it serves, as well as the almost 12 million participants. So our reach is vast. Uh, this, the reach of our state associations is tremendous, and the impact certainly on the lives of young people is exceptionally important. So as you move to our education program, it began in 2007 uh, with an online education course known as Fundamentals of Coaching. In this Fundamentals of Coaching course, it really was what a coach needs to understand, what they need to do, how they need to operate, how they need to interact. Uh, and this was really geared not only toward teacher coaches, which is when I grew up, uh, most of our coaches were teachers. Uh, now as we've moved into the world of uh, lay coaches, if you will, those who have jobs outside of the high schools coming in uh, at various times to conduct practices and games and serve as, as our coaches, the professional development opportunities we felt uh, were dire and, and needed and necessary. 
not only again for our teacher coaches, but also for our lay coaches. So in 2007, uh, this course was developed, again with professional development in mind uh, from A to Z. Uh, our fundamentals of coaching course then led to some additional courses with health and safety. And if you turn to the next slide, uh, Fundamentals continues to be a very strong and popular course, but in 2010, when concussion legislation began to move into our state associations and our state associations had to address those concussion measures, uh, we were asked by our members to respond. And Dan and his team began in 2010 to develop and work with the CDC to develop our concussion in sports course. Very popular course. We've delivered that to over 4 million users to date. So again, a uh, very popular course that is typically involved in all of our sort of certification programs across the country. We've expanded our learning center since then. We have over 60 plus courses now available online through the NFHS Learn platform. Uh, about half of those are health and safety courses, which we do not charge for. Those are free of charge on the NFHS website, and anyone can take those. So feel free to access NFHS Learn and check out our concussion course, our heat acclimatization courses, as well as others. Then the other half are paid courses that uh, we incorporate on our site. Uh, our latest course, as you can see, is Whitney mentioned with the safe sport that she provides at USA Basketball. This is our version of the safe sport course at the NFHS. Dan and his team have recently released this course, Protecting Students from Abuse. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, view that course and, and uh, provide your feedback, quite frankly, because we continue to want to make this applicable to our coaches across the country uh, at our state associations and beyond. Moving into our certification programs from the NFHS, we offer two such certifications. The first is the accredited interscholastic coach. To become an accredited interscholastic coach, I must complete four courses. The fundamentals of coaching course, which I discussed previously, the first aid and safety course, as well as the concussion and sports course. Then I can take the sports specific course of my respective activity or athletic uh, endeavor and complete the accredited interscholastic coach certification. As you can see there, we have about 35,000 of, of those AICs across the country since we've developed that certification. If you move into the certified interscholastic coach, that is our second level of certification. Uh, first, I must complete the AIC qualifications uh, and then move into uh, seven other courses uh, that would continue to broaden my experience, broaden my education, broaden my professional development into strength and conditioning, hazing and bullying, et cetera. You can see those courses listed there. Uh, we have about 4,400 of the CIC designation and certifications across the country to date. Uh, the, next slide, please. The unique thing about the NFHS is our members are self-governed. So in each respective state, as I mentioned, they govern themselves. So they can take the AIC certifications or the CIC certifications and enact those within their respective state associations. Or, and which many of them do, they take the elements of those courses and pot potentially add different elements and determine their own certification programs within their respective states. So each of our 51 state associations have a certification that they require within those respective states but they're not relegated to the AIC or CIC standards. Uh, again, they can modify those as they see fit. Uh, so that's the difference between uh, potentially some of the uh, NCAA models of certification as opposed to uh, the certification models that we have at the NFHS level. All are effective, all are efficient, all are necessary, uh, and all are, are appreciated, I believe, at the state association level. My overview. Uh, and, and I would say that I, I believe that what we understand and as we move forward with our certification and education programs is if our state associations see a need within their respective state, they provide that feedback to the NFHS. And Dan does a wonderful job with his team, not only at the Indianapolis office, but finding the experts across the field to create those courses that are exceptionally beneficial uh, to our student athletes, to our parents, as well as to our coaches and administrators. So is there, a, a, is there data about how many high school coaches have some certification 
whether it's through yours or through a statewide program? As I mentioned, Chair Cartwright, uh, there are 34,000 uh, accredited interscholastic coaches that we have across the country and about 4,400 certified interscholastic coaches. In terms of uh, the respective states themselves, the states gather that information and would be able to share that information. We do not have an aggregate number of coaches, but uh, again, many of our state associations moved into the certification area based on new coaches coming in. So those 20-year coaches that had been in place uh, many states did not require those individuals to move through a certification uh, experience. However, uh, prior to my coming to the NFHS, I was a commissioner in North Carolina, and we would require new coaches coming in, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, achieve a certification level, or if I moved schools. So if I went from school A to school B, if I was making a change, then I would have to engage in that certification and that level of certification. So um, in terms of our data, uh, you have those numbers. Go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to address your, uh, your previous question there, Chair Cartwright, uh, regarding the number of coaches, in our, in our database on the NFHS Learning Center, we have nearly 920,000 uh, coaches that, that, have, that are in our database. So that means they have, they have registered and have uh, engaged in, in some of our online coursework. Uh, and certainly that has been a, a number that um, is, is tremendously higher than it, than it was in prior years. So uh, that, that uh, is our, our data that we collect on how many people have, have taken courses with us that are coaches. i briefly kind of take a, a step back here on kind of our coach education journey. It, it was mentioned about teacher coaches, and that's something that's, that the language that we use within our fundamentals of coaching is that you are a teacher first and a coach second, and that you know winning should never be become a, a you know come ahead of the educational mission and I think that's something that we cannot say enough at our level um, because we are unique in the sense that uh, we do need it, it is an extension of the classroom and that's where um, our, our coach education journey really began in the early 90s and that's when our membership made the decision that hey we we are having more of these non-teacher coaches and this training is we need to formalize this and so we, like most groups, we had the face-to-face -face clinics, and we did that for about 15 years. And now in 2006, our membership said, we need to do better. We need to do more. We have more coaches. We're providing more opportunities for kids to participate. We have more coaches, and they're not, they all can't be in the classroom. So we have to provide more training. And so that's when the NFHS Learning Center was developed, as Davis mentioned, in 2007. And fundamentals of coaching, as he said, is what coaches need to know and be able to do based off the national standards for sport coaches. And that's critically important. And it's, it's one of those things where we wanted to change a culture of coaching, is that not only do coaches need it, but they should want it so that they can create a great experience for those young people that, that we serve. And so. Not only did we have to do that, but if you, if you think back to 2007, the, the, the internet was not what it is today. An online course, I think, was one of those things where it was, it was a, lot of, a lot of reading and not a whole lot of interactivity and engagement. So not only did we want to try to really change the culture of coaching, we need to change a culture of, of online learning. And so that was, that was really a, a big task for us, and it was something that we, we really started integrating a lot of video and uh, not just being able to start the video and kind of walk away. You know, we try to have our videos be, you know, 90 seconds or so, no more than two minutes to where you're interactive, not just, uh, not just video, but some static slides that kind of slow us down a little bit to, to control the pace of the, of the learning. And of course, throw in some interactive questions and uh, things to make sure that you stay engaged in, in the content. <coughs> um, you know, when I, you, you talk about certification, coach certification, every state, every school district kind of defines that a little bit differently. Certification, licensure, certificates, uh, waivers, credentials. And so when we talk about certification at the NFHS, it's, it's really just a platform, it's a pathway of ongoing professional development. And, in, and our certification is simply completing a group of, of coursework. 
And as Davis mentioned, we have over 60 courses to choose from, about half of those available at no cost. And, you know, back when, back when we made this decision to venture into online learning, we were doing about 15,000 coaches per year. And in our first year online, we did about 17,000 of, of fundamentals of coaching. And each and every year now, we do about 60, 60 to 65 of 5,000 of the fundamentals of coaching. And, and, and certainly pleased to say that from a professional development standpoint, this year we're going to do about 1.5 million online courses in which we're getting it to not only coaches, but parents, administrators, students, because as, as we all know, and it was mentioned earlier, it does take, it takes more than the coach. It takes a community surrounding him or her, again, to create that experience for young people to have, to have that interscholastic experience that, that many of us had and um, make, to make it a, a, a positive one at that. And so we, we again, um, we, we want to continue to, to get better, provide the, the best quality, and, and increase our quantity of professional development opportunities for coaches and for the interscholastic community. Thank you. Danielle? Yes, good morning. Uh, I'm Danielle Donahue. I'm the executive director of the Women's Basketball Coaches Association, and I thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, before I begin with my remarks, I do want to acknowledge a couple of people in the room. Um, one is our president of our WBCA board of directors, head coach of George Washington, Jen Rosati. Very thankful that Jen is here today. Um, she's a tremendous leader, uh, a tremendous coach, uh, but also uh, an amazing uh, executive as well. Also, um, Shantiana Keys is newly um, on my staff. She's a member of the Knight Commission, and I'm so proud of her. Uh, she'll be our membership. Um, she's our uh, manager of education, and I'm talking a lot about education today, and so I'm very proud of her. Um, and proud that she's part of your group. Um, I look for great things in her future. She's a rising star. Um, founded in 1981, the Women's Basketball Coaches Association is the professional association for coaches of women's and girls basketball at all levels of competition. The WBCA offers educational resources that coaches need to help make them better leaders, teachers, and mentors to their players, provides opportunities for coaches to connect with peers in the profession, serves as the unifying voice of a diverse community of coaches to those organizations that control the game, and celebrates those coaches, players, and other individuals who excel each year and contribute to the advancement of our sport. When I was hired in July of 2014, the WBCA Board of Directors was prepared to make a significant investment to build a certification program for women's basketball coaches. The certification program would include both digital and in-person learning opportunities. The coach would have an opportunity to advance from a basic level to an advanced level by completing the curriculum and earning recommendations from her or his peers we were all but ready to begin building. Then we did our market research by asking head coaches, assistant coaches, and athletics directors if they wanted or needed this. The data was powerful. Athletics directors said they would not make hires using a certification program. They would hire and fire due to performance and perceived fit on a campus. Head coaches said they would not make time to invest in getting certified because they were already at the top of the profession and their athletics directors would not evaluate them more positively if they had received certification. Assistant coaches, on the other hand, wanted it. They were hungry to grow and advance in their careers. Because of the data in 2014, our board of directors decided it was not a wise investment to build a certification program that everyone would not embrace and use. Instead, we began to revise existing and develop new educational programs 
for member coaches and to provide them as optional learning opportunities. Over the last four years, we have invested heavily in educational development for our coaches. Our, educa our educational focus is to serve coaches of women's basketball and help them grow throughout their coaching journey. The handout provided in your materials is a high-level overview of our educational programming throughout the year. Is there a way to see the handout, or do you all have this handout in your materials? I do. I'm going to refer to that now. If you have this in your materials, that's where I'm going. It's, uh, for, for our group, it's behind tab uh, seven. Last page, behind tab seven, last page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't have living color. <laughs> yes, this one's fun. Okay, um, we offer digital and in-person learning opportunities 365 days of the year. You will see on your handout off-season programs like the Coaches Classrooms and Minority Coaches Forum. The Coaches Classrooms are held within each region. It's for coaches to share within the vertical pipeline of their region. These opportunities most of the time are hosted by collegiate coaches, but all coaches in our membership are invited. We have lots of high school coaches that attend and other levels of the collegiate space that attend. Our Minority Coaches Forum is in partnership with the NCAA. 12 minority coaches who are preparing to become head coaches participate in a two-day program at Darden School of Business at the University of Virginia. That program largely has speakers that are professionals in the industry, and then there is peer-to-peer -peer learning within that group. In-season programs, you'll see on the right-hand side of the handout, we have our Coach to Coach Mentor Program. This year, we had over 458 coaches participating. This program, we group coaches in huddles of four to six coaches. There are two mentors per huddle, and each group is grouped based on what the coaches want to uh, address or learn about. You may have a coach that wants to be a head coach one day. Well, they're going to be grouped appropriately. You may have a head coach, or you may have coaches that want to simply be outstanding assistant coaches. Well, they're grouped appropriately. You may have a director of basketball operations or a video coordinator who want to be coaches one day. Well, they're also grouped appropriately. These um, mentor huddles, as we call them, happen one, there's one phone call every month for 60 minutes. And it's a wonderful opportunity for coaches to share with one another. This is all about peer-to-peer -peer learning and peer-to-peer -peer support. Also in season is our monthly webinar series. This covers a variety of topics. It's one topic per month. It's a webinar for 30 minutes during lunchtime. And these topics, we may have coaches that present or uh, professionals in different segments of the business present to help the coaches learn about different skills and different topics. Finally, in season, we just launched our new open practice registry. This open practice registry is for um, coaches at the collegiate level um, to open up their practices for other coaches to come and watch and learn. Um, this registry categorizes coaches in whatever region you're in. You can go to our website, sort for what region you're in, and you can see all the different programs that you're invited to go watch their practice. We have lots of high school coaches and other levels of collegiate coaches that are able to go and watch um, other coaches practice so that they can learn for themselves uh, and grow in their own profession. Finally, you'll see um, in the box on the bottom left-hand side is our convention programs. Um, our convention is a four-day event. Right now, our average is about 2,400 coaches that attend our annual convention. It's held in conjunction with the Women's Final Four. We have learning labs, on-court presentations, focus sessions, business meetings, and then these programs that are on your handout. I'm going to go over the programs. 
Uh, the first program is our So You Want to Be a Coach program. This program is a three-day program, and it also includes a webinar for one year. This is for 60 graduating seniors who have said they want to go into coaching as a career, and it's our way to onboard them into their next steps of becoming a coach. Next is our 30 Under 30 program. This is an award series where peers let us know who the rising stars in our profession are. It's a single afternoon program at the convention, and it includes a webinar program for one year. These young folks are going to be our next great coaches, and so we want to invest in them early. Our Excel Head Coaches <coughs> Workshop, it's an invitation-only afternoon session for 30 NCAA Division I coaches. This is all about current issues. This is an opportunity where we invite um, 30 coaches and we have speakers that could be um, about mental health, it could be about um, what's going on from a legal perspective, how to hire, how to build your staff, all sorts of important current um, topics. Next is Career Day. Thursday, our first day of our convention, is all about sharpening your skills as to how you present yourself. We have almost speed dating with some administrators where coaches can practice interviewing in 15-minute segments of how do you present yourself. Um, we have opportunities for them to build their resumes and learn how to make their resumes look better and tell a proper story of, of the success that they've had. Um, we also do headshots and other coaching as to how they can present themselves in a very professional way. Um, this uh, speed dating piece also in terms of the interview session um, is also wildly popular with our administrators because it helps them build a list of up-and-coming coaches that they one day may want to hire. And then finally, our So You Want to Be a Head Coach um, program. It's a single afternoon program. It also includes a webinar program for one year. This is for our assistant coaches that know that one day they want to aspire to be a head coach, and they want to put that work in right now to prepare themselves for when that one day um, they have the opportunity to sit in that head coach's chair. In closing, our new strategic plan that was adopted in July of this year has dedicated one of three pillars to coaches' education. We will continue to make a significant investment in this area, and we are proud of the impact our member coaches make on student athletes who play women's basketball. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks to all of our panelists. I, I want to get a better feel for the extent to which some of these things are required. Um, Danielle, I, I heard your chilling comment that um, that there wasn't a lot of support from head coaches and athletics directors about, about requiring this. So you went down the path of let's, let's build a lot of opportunities and through influence, let's get our population involved. Davis, I think I heard the same thing from you, that uh, you're providing an opportunity for these two levels of certification. There are certification levels in states but I think I heard that high schools are not requiring that their coaches hold these certifications in order to work at that level. Is that right? Not necessarily the AIC or the CIC designation of certification, but all of our state associations have requirements in their respective states that coaches are required to complete. They just may not be identical to the AIC or okay. CIC criteria. And, and Terry, uh, are Division II institutions requiring that their head coaches go through the education program? So right now what's required is the coaches certification test, but if the proposal at the convention is adopted by the membership, then coaches will be required to complete modules in Division II University in order to recruit off campus, but also to participate in countable athletically related activities with their student athletes. Okay. And, and what's driving that? Is it presidential leadership? Is it needs expressed by coaches, a combination of those and other things? I think it's a combination of all of that. So I think it's a, um, a realization that there needs to be um, baseline understanding by coaches, particularly in the eligibility and recruiting world, but I also think in the health and safety um, pieces, those will also be some of the required. 
uh, modules and then also listening to coaches and them wanting a better system to actually learn and then retain that information on an ongoing basis. And uh, while we didn't get to see the, the actual interactions, I'm imagining that you've got a pretty good infrastructure built and you've oriented the content toward Division Two. but is the infrastructure such that Division One or Division Three could load in their content? Yes, yeah, so it's built into a, a learning management system that any um, division uh, could use, and then as you indicated, the content right now is, is Division Two specific, but the health and safety modules can be used across all three divisions. Those were built in partnership with the Sports Science Institute, and, and, and any division can use those, and they're available on the NCA website, not just in Division Two University. Okay. So as we look at a, a recommendation that the Knight Commission has made to set minimal standards and require all coaches to meet them, I think we're hearing that the, the rock we're pushing up this hill is, is large and heavy. Danielle, you look like you want to respond. Well, I, I, I guess I would, I would say that um, what I have found with our programs is they are very popular and they are good. <coughs> Um, our coaches are developing at a, a rapid pace and they are lifetime learners and that's part of our culture is to encourage lifetime learning. Um, but I would also say it is very important that there is an expectation by a governing body that um, this sort of education is expected. That's helpful. Thank you. I saw Walt and Peter. So Walt, you want to begin, please? I wonder, uh, especially Coach Cantrell, if you would uh, comment on this question. Is coaching a profession? <coughs> and if it's a profession, what does that entail? And if it's not a profession, why not? I think it is a profession. I think it's uh, one that people don't take, uh, have not taken very seriously in the past what it takes to be a coach, the hours, that's, that, that's required of a coach, just not at the field. Uh, you know, like for me, uh, the investment that I have in my student athletes, I can only speak for me. It's much more about the wins and the losses. It's, uh, it's about their development for life. Um, you know, when we, our, our three uh, things that drive our program is be the best possible person you can be, get your education, and then be the best possible player you can be. I feel like if we're getting the first two, we're going to, it's easier to get the third. If we're concentrating on the third, we're probably letting go the first two. And, 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 and to me, it, that's not what it's about. So for me, in, in coaching in Division Two at the University of North Georgia, we've had some pro athletes, okay? We've had some guys sign professional contracts, but 99.9% .9 of them are not. So the development of that, that they learned through the program that we teach to be better fathers, to be, you know, uh, the fathers they're going to be. To law, We've got law, uh, doctors, lawyers. We've got, I've, I've got 45 people that played for me or players that are coaches now, from professional ranks to high school to college. So, so apparently our program has made an impact on them in the 20 years that it's been there. But I think the development of the person is first and foremost the most important thing as coaches that we do. If we fail at that, then to me we fail at everything. Because what I've learned over the time that I've been fortunate enough to coach, playing professionally, playing college baseball, high school, I've, none, I've known nothing but baseball since I was five years old. But the one thing that I've learned as I've gotten older, it's all about the relationships and the people and watching young men grow to function in life. So to me, um, you know, I've been very blessed in, in, in my profession as being a coach to, to won some championships and done some great things. But to me, uh, nothing outweighs what we've done uh, to, of the development of the young man that we have in our program, and I'm very proud of that. So I, I think it's a profession to, to answer your question. Um, so can I just follow up just yeah, one sure. second? So then I agree with you. I mean, I'm one of the... 99.9% .9 who played college baseball and never 
got any better, but I <laughs> certainly think I got better in the first two things you right. mentioned. Um, the, the question I have is, if it's a profession, then shouldn't, shouldn't all levels of coaching involve some sort of edu continuing professional education? I mean, we heard how the high schools are doing it. We've heard earlier about how the um, USA Basketball is doing it. Now we've heard about Division Two. Why not Division One or Division Three? If they're all coaching, and they're all doing mo exactly, what I think, what you said so eloquently, um, shouldn't that be a standard for all the divisions in the NCAA? <laughs> for me, absolutely. I, I don't. I don't have a problem saying that. I, I, I do. I think it's our responsibility as leaders of young men, young women, whatever you coach, that the ultimate responsibility. Yeah, you want to win, and I understand all that. But what are you What are you doing on the people end of it? And, and, and that's getting lost more and more. And um, you know, I think coaches need to be more educated. And let's not forget that we're we're. we're you know, we're at a point in time with these young men or women's lives where they're leaving high school and we're a big part of what, what they look to for what the next part of their life's going to be. And if we, don't, if, we're not, if we don't do it the right way, what, what have we helped them gain by getting ready to go into the real world? Now, you know, a lot of people don't think like me. I understand that. This is the way I think. But I think it's the most important thing that we do is the development of the person. And until, you know, and so coaches need to be uh, educated more. I need to be educated more. I need to be held to a standard. I'm taking care of somebody's uh, young uh, son, you know, uh, coaches in here or other coaches taking care of somebody's daughter. You know, I don't take that lightly. And on the recruiting, when they come, I, I tell them, I say, I don't know if you're going to be an All-American, you're going to get drafted, you're going to play. But I'm going to take your son, and I'm going to be, his, you know, he, I'm going to be his dad while he's here. So that that goes along with uh, the good times and the bad times. The I don't I don't believe I think in coaching now, we tell a lot of people what they want to hear instead of telling them what they need to hear. So, you know, that's just my opinion on that. But I'm but I'm 100% uh, on on those comments. I would say some of our newer coaches at the Division One level have most likely had some type of training of some type in coaching education because typically they're moving from high school ranks into uh, a, a stair-step approach as opposed to the old days when you had the school of hard knocks. That's how you learned uh, as, a, as an old coach uh, at the collegiate division one level and really at all levels. Uh, but I, I think with the implementation of not only our high school programs as well as uh, our programs at the USA basketball level, uh, and, and others, that hopefully there is some training that we're seeing from our newer coaches that are reaching the Division I level. Not to say that there couldn't be more, but I am hopeful that as our coaches become collegiate coaches, uh, certainly there has been some, some education. I, I'd like to uh, agree with you on some of that, but I think at the highest levels, the criteria for why people are getting hired has very little to do with how certified they are and uh, a lot more to do with what kind of connections they have to recruiting. Sure. And um, even those that are getting hired as head coaches are getting hired as head coaches because they've come from programs where they've shown they can recruit results. And so uh, it's revealing that your, your research suggested that ADs were less interested in certification and education and, and preparation as they were other things. And so that's, a, that's all you need to know is that the people that are making decisions about who they hire are paying less attention to the things that are probably most important because we're all talking out of both sides of our mouth about wanting to do what's in the best interest of student athletes and yet we're not paying attention to whether the people are actually qualified to uh, influence them. And to that point, um, David's mentioned it and others talked about the role that coaches play in the life of a, of a young person. And so um, I'm just curious as to, given this, the, uh, the environment that kids are growing up in now, and um, some of the vitriol that's out there in, in the public discourse, um, are you uh, providing coaches with um, skills and information with respect to dealing with, with difference, with conflict, uh, with communication? How, how are coaches being um, helped 
to have difficult conversations about the, the kind of diversity that they have in their programs, uh, the, the environments that kids are growing up in. I know that you have the bullying prevention and hazing um, education, which is crucial, but the, the appreciation of difference, how coaches can talk to their young people about um, um, the diversity and, and um, difference. And um, so just I'm not sure if that's more at the um, next level down, if you will, in terms of your, your offerings. But I would just say now more than ever, um, coaches are, are coaching really diverse teams in, in every way. Uh, learning styles and family backgrounds and social, uh, sexual orientations and, and um, uh, you know, ethnicities. Um, and, and the more that we can help prepare coaches for how to deal with, with those dynamics on their team, uh, we'll be doing the, the student athletes a, a service as well as the coaches. Well, in our 60 plus courses that we offer, we do have a course teaching and modeling behavior. And Dan may want to mention uh, the aspects of that. So we, we are, uh, I think, addressing some of those needs. Certainly there can be more uh, that we can put in the, in the course offerings, but uh, we do try to respond to those, those, um, those needs by our state association. Go ahead, Daniel. And I, I would just also add, um, from a WBCA perspective, we have been very focused on diversity and inclusion and mental health um, as two really big um, topics that we have, have hit for the last two years at our convention and then with our educational programming, our, our online education throughout the year. Um, I think the mental health piece is a really big um, big focus right now that we all um, need to be concerned about. And I know from, from our speaking points, um, we are really encouraging our coaches to connect with the professionals on their campuses and don't feel like you have to do everything as a coach. You may not be trained to deal um, with some of the, the challenges that your student athletes are going through, but you can connect them to those professionals that are on campus and be supportive of, of them working with those professionals. Um, but also the, the diversity and inclusion is a, a, a very important topic as well as we're trying to deal with people from different backgrounds and how do we be supportive, how do we champion um, people to have different opportunities. And um, so I think those are two of our, our big focus points now. Arnie, you had a question? Sorry, Just real Dan. quick here. We, we are finalizing a, a student mental health course, uh, to, your, to your point, uh, Peter, and we're also working on an inclusion piece um, for, for coaches and, and the community at large regarding LGBTQ um, issues and topics and situations for, for, again, for the community. And so those are things that we do try to broaden uh, all of our awareness and, and uh, of those topics. Go ahead, Arnie. Danielle, of course, it's slightly off topic, but we've talked at previous meetings about the lack of diversity in women in the ranks of the athletic directors. Is there anything you guys are doing to train? Some of your coaches may want to coach forever, but some of them may aspire to run athletic departments. Is there anything you're doing to train your coaches or give them some insight into the world of becoming an AD potential? Yes, and that's a, a great question. Uh, we have a, a fantastic strategic partner uh, named Women Leaders. Uh, we have worked very hand in hand with them during our conventions. We have a lot of coaches that do aspire to be administrators, um, but also broadcasters on television. Um, and some also may be interested in serving the sport in different ways. We do try to make sure that we have lots of visibility at our convention um, and opportunities for coaches to be mentored and to build relationship. Um, with various administrators so that they have an opportunity to know not only how to work well with their administrators while they're a coach, um, but that they could consider uh, administration as a career. Um, we do have a, a, a lot of women and men that are athletics directors who are very diligent about trying to get in front of our membership and showing our membership um, that they too could be an athletic director one day. I I had Nancy, and then Scott, and then Christine. Well, I was just thinking uh, of Walt's question about the profession of coaching. And um, typically, there's a definition of the cognitive and the content knowledge, and it comes together in uh, some kind of applied learning, clinical experience. I mean, if we want to mimic 
other uh, more established professions. I, I think when we started development on college campuses, we hired people who do something about how to get along with other people. But it's really advanced into a profession, and there's a credentialing process. So given that uh, we are encouraged that the NCAA, uh, at the recommendation of the Knight Foundation and, or the Knight Commission and the Rice Commission, would really seriously consider this, there are a lot of options out here. In the last two hours, we've heard four different cuts at what this curriculum could look like. They all sound terrific to me. Do you imagine a time when those of you designing curriculum for the profession of coaching could come together in some kind of unified agreement that this is the credential? And you don't, I mean, you could all sell it, but you don't buy one brand over another in a profession. You buy a coordinated vision of what that profession is. And for the NCAA to choose to get into this other than what we're learning, which is at the moment, but correct me, um, the NCAA has um, decided at the moment that ca campuses can do their own training as, ne as needed, but I think we're trying to move to something more organized. So is there any effort to coordinate your curricula into a, cre a credentialed opportunity for all coaches? At, at, and maybe context does matter from high school to middle school to young people to college or to the NBA, but I just wonder, there's a lot out there. Should we just pick and choose? Or should we unify the concept of coaching as a profession led by these important professional organizations to help the NCAA, for instance, adopt a credentialing pathway? It's complicated, but I just, you're all sort of doing your own thing, all of which is really good, but for us listening, how would you put all that together? I think it's a really, I think it's a really important question and, and, and comment. And, and the NFHS has really found, as David said, the experts to work with. So many, many of the groups, we do, we do work with them, especially in the sports specific areas. And it was mentioned earlier that we already work with the NCAA when it comes to the eligibility center, because it makes all the sense in the world for us to work with the NCAA eligibility center and, and reaching our, our high schools and our constituents. And, and so, Absolutely, and I, I think I think we we take great pride in that we do work with a whole lot of organizations already and do find the experts uh, because a lot of this curriculum it's just not coming out of, of Indianapolis. It is coming truly from the experts at net, from national coaches associations or national governing bodies, uh, the content experts, and so uh, we certainly have found a lot of value in that. That we're not trying to recreate the wheel. Um, yeah, I just suggest suggesting a standard of excellence right. that could coalesce your knowledge base into something really important that everybody respects. And maybe that's part of an emerging profession. You go through these stages. You have a precedent. You've got, you got a membership I, yeah, a division think, already mm -hmm. taking steps to do that. It's amazing what, what you've already done in a short period of time. I think your idea has a lot of merit, and I think there is definite room for greater collaboration among all groups to create something that you've suggested. I'd say we're a touch different just in terms of our federation status. And so I do believe that uh, what we provide in terms of our, our certification uh, modules, our certification courses, uh, we do provide what we feel is the, is the standard certainly, again, our state associations with their autonomous uh, governance within their respective states make that determination. But I believe the way we're structured, we're, we're, um, we're as effective as we can be in that endeavor. Scott, thank you. Yeah, it's been very interesting, actually encouraging hearing each of you speak about what you're doing in your respective organizations. Uh, I'm wondering, though, about whether any of this could really be taken to Division I athletics, uh, which is where all the problems are. That brings us together. So, uh, and it isn't to say that you don't have your own issues, and you're the breeding ground for Division One many times. Do you think this is a hopeless task to bring what we're talking about here to Division One in the NCAA for, say, football and men's basketball and maybe baseball, maybe all of it, um, or is it the market? I think you were saying to now is is listen. If you're a head coach, you don't need this, and the market's going to not evaluate whether you're certified or you follow these rules, it's gonna just count on wins and losses. So what do you think about everything you're talking about and somehow getting that discipline 
and expectation at the Division I level? I would just say, that, uh, from my perspective, I think it's a, it's a worthy aspiration, and we need to work towards that. Um, in terms of how it works and, and what it looks like, um, I think we, we need a number of conversations to try to figure out um, how, how, uh, who's, holding, who's holding everyone accountable. And a lot of times, um, whoever the governing body is, at whatever level of the sport it is, um, those rules are important, and so I would say I, I think it's an important thing for us to chase, and I do think we can address it. And, Christine, and, I'm, sorry. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, what I would add, what I would add to that is, um, so both Division One and Two require the coach's certification test, and so um, similar requirements about understanding eligibility and recruiting. Division Two is moving that content to more of the Division Two university and online uh, module system. I think Division One has seen what we've done. They're having active conversations, and we'll have active conversations because the. Um, requirements are the same, and I think they also see the utility to try and bring this type of education to their Division One coaches um, through the coaches certification exam to bring it to an online system. Thanks. Christine? So, Terry, my question is for you. Um, as a faculty rep who watches the coaches, right, I proctor the coaches exam each summer. Um, I, I hate to lose the entertainment value of how nervous they get. My, <laughs> my students who take my chemistry exams don't even look that nervous. So it is entertaining, but I, I, I am, was very excited to hear when Division Two was going down this road because I, I feel like the coaches, you know, they take a few practice tests right before they come in and they run in and, and do this, and I'm not sure that the value continues as you mentioned. Um, I am also excited to hear you know, the, the kind of fallout for not passing that exam was a 30-day window. 30 days later, you could take it again, uh, but in between, you couldn't recruit. And, and that you've gone to a model where you basically can't, can't coach uh, if you don't pass. Is there still a window of time before you can do the modules again? Or is there anything similar to that 30-day kind of waiting period in your new uh, situation? Yeah, so under the new system, it won't be 30 days. It'll probably be about 24 hours where they're going to have to um, wait to go back in and take the module again and to answer the questions at the end in order to satisfy completion of the module. And it, I, I think it would be crippling to have the 30-day window, and especially at, at Division Two, you don't have a whole lot of extra coaches mm -hmm. in programs. Um, what kind of pushback did you get um, when you were developing this with the thought of you couldn't do any coaching activities until you passed these modules? How did those conversations go? Yeah, so no, it's a good question. So ultimately, coaches have between um, really like the start of April through the end of August to complete the modules before the um, penalties would kick in. So there is time to do the completion. I think we did hear from some coaches about the concern um, participating in, in countable athletic related activities, but I think as it's made its way through the Division II governance structure, the one thing that's been commented more than once is that, um, particularly in the Division II model, there are a lot of coaches who don't recruit off campus, and so there was really no way in order to have them complete the module, so there needed to be an additional um, penalty um, involved. Plus, there are a lot of rules that you can break on campus, never leaving campus. Right. And so the knowledge and understanding of that was critical. And so I think um, coaches understand that there is some baseline knowledge that they need to know in order to participate and be with their um, student athletes. And with the addition of the health and safety modules, I think coaches have found that to be even more critical and believe in the concept that they need to complete this to be able to participate in their coaching activities. Thank you. I, I also think it, it, at the end of the day, like most things, it comes down to individual leadership and um, leadership on individual campuses and in departments and what the leadership is emphasizing to the folks that work with them and for them is always going to be first and foremost. So uh, part of our issue as a membership is we keep waiting for the um, powers on high to pass legislation that then tells us how we should act and how we should do things on behalf of kids or whatever, when in reality, if we're in this for the right reasons, we should be just doing those things. And so as an athletic director, 
you know, uh, even if you can't recruit off campus, I want to know that you're investing in your own development because that's going to mean that the experience for the student athletes is going to be enhanced because you're better prepared to do your job. That's leadership, you know? And it shouldn't be that the only reason I'm doing it is because I can't go off and recruit. And it, that leadership has to start at the presidential level and trickle down to, to the athletic department level with the athletic director and then the head coaches and, and everybody else. Well said. Uh, we think we have. Third time's the charm. I we think, think so. <laughs> so uh, as we wrap up, we'll, we'll watch uh, a couple of minutes of the, the uh, program just to get a feel for how it works and then say thank you to our panelists. So press on, technical people. <laughs> Listen closely, Coach. This one's important. It is a violation for a student athlete to compete unless they meet all eligibility requirements and are certified to play by the institution. Your institution could be fined, forced to forfeit wins, or experience bad publicity if a student athlete competes while ineligible. Eligibility is important because academic integrity is a cornerstone of intercollegiate athletics. After all, student athletes are students first, athletes second. Respect, integrity, and responsibility are critical values that help prepare student athletes for success in competition, the workplace, and in life. To understand eligibility, there are a few basic terms to know. First, what does it mean to be eligible? To be eligible for competition, student athletes are enrolled full-time, in good academic standing, and making progress toward a baccalaureate or equivalent degree. In addition to meeting all applicable NCAA bylaws, student athletes must also comply with any institutional and conference rules and regulations. Good academic standing is determined by academic authorities of the institution. Student athletes are subject to the same minimum standards as other students who participate in extracurricular activities. Actions of academic misconduct could impact the eligibility of a student athlete. Academic misconduct is any violation or breach of an institutional policy regarding academic honesty or integrity, such as an academic offense, academic honor code violation, plagiarism, or academic fraud. As a coach, it is your responsibility to help make sure your student athletes are eligible to play under NCAA rules and regulations. Ask your compliance administrator if you have any questions. Well, I think we've all indicated in a variety of ways that the work that you're doing in your respective organizations is quite impressive. Uh, we're encouraged by the investments that you're making in education and development of coaches. So thank you for being with us and sharing today. Uh, we'll adjourn this session and reconvene at 1125 for our next panel. Thank you. Thank you.